Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Q3 FY22 earnings conference call of Sun Pharmaceuticals Industries Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Nimish Desai, Head of Investor Relations. Thank you. And over to you, Mr. Desai. Thank you. Uh, good evening and a warm welcome to our third quarter FY22 earnings call. I'm Nimish from the Sun Pharma Investor Relations team. We hope you received the Q3 financials and the press release that was sent out earlier in the day. These are also available on our website. Uh, we have with us Mr. Dilip Sangvi, our Managing Director, Mr. Mulidharan, CFO, Mr. Abhay Gandhi, CEO of North America, and Mr. Kirti Garnokar, uh, CEO of India Business. Today, the team will discuss performance highlights, update on strategies, and respond to any questions that you may have. As is usual, for the ease of discussion, we will look at the consolidated financials. And just as a reminder, this call is uh, being recorded and the review will be available for the next few days. The call transcript will also be put up on our website shortly. The discussion today might include certain forward-looking statements, and this must be viewed in conjunction with the risk that our business faces. You are requested to ask two questions in the initial round. If you have any more questions, you are requested to rejoin the queue. I also request all of you to kindly send in your questions that may remain unanswered today. I will now hand over the call to Mr. Sampi. Thank you, Nimish. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this earnings call after the announcement of financial results for the third quarter of FY22. I hope you and your family are doing well. Let me discuss some of the key highlights. Consolidated revenue for the quarter were at rupees 98,142 million, recording a growth of about 11% year on year, driven by strong performance across markets. Despite rising costs, we have achieved higher profitability. We continue to focus on top-line growth, operational efficiencies, and business continuity. For Q3, branded formulation business in India and emerging markets together now account for about 50% of global consolidated revenues. Let me now update you on our global specialty business. I am happy to inform you that our global specialty revenue for the first nine months have already crossed previous full year revenues. For Q3, our global specialty revenues were approximately US dollar 183 million across all markets, up about 21% year on year. The global specialty revenues do not include illumetry and market revenues. As you all are aware, we launched Illumia in Canada and Winlevy in the US during the quarter. Recently, we also announced launch of Sequa in Canada. Speciality R&D accounted for approximately 22% of our total r and This is the operator, so we are not able to hear you. This 
is the operator, so we are not able to hear your audio, please, right? Ladies and gentlemen, the line for Mr. Dilip Sangvi has got disconnected. Request you all to please stay online while we reconnect him. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you for patiently waiting. The line for the management is reconnected. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Uh, this is Murli Dharan, CFO. Sorry, we got disconnected. We are back again. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shangri. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to all of you. Our Q3 financials are already with you. As usual, we look at key consolidated financials. We recorded the highest ever quarterly revenues at Rs. 98,142 million in Q3, up by about 11% over Q3 last year. Retail cost as a percentage of revenues was 27%. Stop costs were up by 8% year on year and stands at 18.9% of revenues. Other expenses up 13% year on year and stands at 28.1% of revenues. Increases attributed towards higher selling and distribution and traveling expenses while in Q3 of last year, these expenses were lower on account of global pandemic. As indicated in our past earnings calls, the expenses are seeing an increasing trend across all the markets as we reach full normalization. Forex loss for the quarter was Rs. 106 million compared to gain of Rs. 716 million for the Q3 last year. EBITDA for Q3 was at Rs. 25,574 million, up by 7.5% year on year with EBITDA margin at 26.1%. It is important to note that we have been able to record EBITDA growth despite a significant increase in other expenses and a negative swing in Forex. Reported net profit for the quarter was at Rs. 20,588 million, up 11% over net profit of Q3 last year. The reported EPS for the quarter was Rs. 8.60. Let me now discuss the key movements versus Q2 FI22. Our consolidated revenues were up by 3% quarter on quarter at Rs. 98,142 million, primarily driven by the speciality business. Material cost stands at 27% of revenues. For Q3, other expenses were at 28.1% of revenues, higher than Q2 on account of higher selling and distribution expenses. We had a forex loss of Rs. 106 million for Q3 as against forex loss of Rs. 764 million in Q2. EBITDA for Q3 stands at Rs. 25,574 million, which is flat compared to Q2. It is important to note that in Q2, we had a milestone income of US dollar 10 million, excluding which we would have recorded a minor growth in EBITDA sequentially. Other income for Q3 was higher compared to Q2, mainly due to settlement income from DUSA via frontera litigation and interest on income tax refund. Reported net profit for Q3 was at Rs. 20,588 million, marginally higher than Q2 this year. Now we will discuss the nine-month performance. For the nine-month period, net revenues were at Rs. 290,403 million, 
a growth of 17% over the 9 month period last year staff cost stands at 18.6% of revenues lower than 9 month last year however in absolute terms the staff cost has increased on account of annual merit increases other expenses were at 27.3% of revenues lower than 9 month period last year however in absolute terms the other expenses have increased on account of higher selling distribution and traveling expenses while in the 9 month of last year these expenses are lower on account of pandemic related restrictions across markets as a result of the above the ebitda for the 9 month was at rupees 78900 million a growth of 26.5% over the 9 month last year with ebitda margins of 27.2% compared to 25.2% year on year excluding the exceptional items adjusted net profit for 9 month fy22 was at rupees 60851 million up by about 33% year on year reported net profit for 9 month fy22 was at rupees 55500 million the company has repaid debt of about us dollar 254 million in the first 9 months of the current fiscal as of 31st december 2021 we continue to remain net cash positive even at the ex arrow level with us dollar 767 million of net cash at consolidated level including tarot the company has a net cash of about us dollar 2.1 billion let me now briefly discuss tarot's performance tarot posted q3 fy22 revenues of us dollar 139 million a net profit of us dollar 26.3 million higher by 5% and 6% respectively over q2 fy22 on year on year basis revenues for q3 fy22 were flat while the net profit was lower by about 20% for nine months revenues were at us dollar 418 million up 4% year on year and adjusted net profit was at us dollar 99.2 million down by about 7% year on year i will now hand over to mr kirthi golorkar who will share the performance of our india business thank you morli let me take you through the performance of our india business for q3 the formulation revenues in india were rupees 31676 million recording a strong growth of about 15% over q3 last year india business accounted for about 32% of consolidated revenue for q3 despite the challenging and competitive environment we have maintained the trend of the past few quarters of outperforming the average industry growth which has led to increase in market share our market share has been gradually increasing over the past few quarters for q3 it was 8.6% compared to 8.1% in q in q2 as per aiocd average data on mat basis as per aiocd average data for december 2021 our market share was 8.2% we have witnessed a growth across most of our therapies the growth was driven by combination of factors like improved demand for non covid treatments which led to higher growth in chronic semi chronic segment better patient flow to doctors clinic and increased healthcare awareness as per aiocd average data for q3 for some of our key therapy areas like cns cvd and gastro we outperformed the segment growth as per the data our growth in cns was 7.8% and then 7.5% for overall cns segment in cvd also against 3.3% segment growth our growth was 12% also in gastro the therapy grew by 15.7% against the segment growth of 10.8% we had a negligible revenues of covid products in q3 field force operations were near to normal in q3 with almost all doctor clinics operational the productivity of the new field force which has started improving and about 70% of the territories for the new field force are performing as per our expectation while the performance for the remaining 30% is likely to improve going forward travel cost for medical representatives was near to normal while we continue to see some saving in terms of 
cost of medical conferences. For Q3, we launched 25 new products in Indian market. Sun Pharma is the largest pharmaceutical company in India, and as per SMSRC report, we are number one ranked by prescription with 11 different doctor categories. We also continue to remain the partner of choice for licensing of products, given our strong number one position in many therapy areas, including therapies for the treatment of COVID infection coupled with our large distribution network. I will now hand over the call to Abhay. Thank you, Kirsi. I will briefly discuss the performance highlights of our U.S. businesses. For Q3, our overall formulation revenues in the U.S. grew by about 6% over Q3 last year to about U.S. dollar 397 million. The main driver of growth was the specialty business. U.S. accounted for about 30% of consolidated revenues for the quarter. While doctor clinics are open in the U.S. during the quarter, the situation is yet to fully normalize. Patient flow to doctor clinics as well as frequency of doctor calls by our medical representatives are still both below pre-COVID levels. Our specialty revenues in U.S. have grown over Q3 last year, mainly driven by Illumia, Sequa, and Levula. Specialty revenues are significantly higher compared to September 2021 quarter, mainly driven by Illumia, Sequa, Levulan, and Absorica. We have done well in the specialty business in U.S. as well as globally over the last few years. Global specialty revenue contribution has doubled from about 7% in FY18 to about 14% in Q3 FY22. As you are all aware, we launched WinLevy in the U.S. in November 2021. We have received a good response from doctors for the product, as there is a need in the market for a new mechanism of action to treat acne, which WinLevy is addressing. It is the first time that an androgen inhibitor is being used for treating acne. Our established presence in the dermatology market will help in ramping up in levy going forward. For competitive and strategic reasons, we will not be able to share granular details on wind levy on this call. Let me now update you on our U.S. generics business. While the U.S. generic business continues to be competitive, the Sun x generic business has stabilized. While we do experience price erosion, we have been able to counter it by a combination of new launches and better supply chain management. During the quarter, we launched five generic products in the U.S. market. We have received approval for generic Anthocyanin B liposome injection, and we are eligible for 180 days of exclusivity for the product under the competitive generic therapy designation by the U.S. FDA. We will be launching the product shortly in the U.S. I will now hand over the call back to Mr. Shandy. Thank you, Abhay. <clears throat> I will briefly discuss the performance highlights of our other businesses as well as give you an update on our R&D initiatives. Our branded formulation revenues in emerging markets, we're at US dollar 239 million for third quarter, up by about 17% year on year, and lower by about 2% over second quarter this year. The underlying growth in constant currency terms were about 15% year on year, Emerging markets accounted for about 18% of total revenue for third quarter. Amongst the largest market in local currency terms, Romania has grown by about 25%, Russia by 17%, South Africa by 33%, 
and Brazil by 29%. Formulation revenues in rest of the world market, excluding the U.S. and emerging markets, were U.S. dollar 181 million in the third quarter, up by about 3% over third quarter last year. Rest of the world markets accounted for approximately 14% of consolidated third quarter revenues. API revenues for the third quarter were at 4,710 million, higher by about 5% over third quarter last year and by about 8% over second quarter. We continue to invest in building a R&D pipeline for both the global generics and the specialty businesses. R&D efforts are ongoing for the U.S., emerging markets, ROW markets, and for India. Consolidated R&D investment for third quarter were at U.S. was at rupees 5,471 million compared to 5,593 million for third quarter last year. Our current generic pipeline for the U.S. market includes 88 ANDAs and 13 NDAs awaiting approval with the U.S. FDA. Lastly, the board of directors today declared an interim dividend of rupees 7 per share against rupees 5.5 per share declared last year, keeping distribution percentage of the profit constant. With this, I would like to leave the floor open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and 2. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Reminder to the participants, anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1. First question is from the line of Neha from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Yep. Thank you for taking my question. My first question uh, is on the U.S. specialty business. Uh, Abhay, if I heard correctly, uh, most of the quarter and quarter increase uh, you indicated were from, you know, your other products other than Winberry. So is it fair to assume that uh, the 183 million does not include any large launch quantity sort of supplies, uh, you know, uh, and therefore should not normalize? Is that a fair understanding? What, what I understood uh, from whatever I could hear, uh, Nina, is you were asking whether there was an extra large uh, stock up during the launch of Bin Levy. Is that the question? Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, no, I don't think so, because I think uh, what we are seeing today as buying from the wholesalers is almost as per what they are selling out of their warehouses. So it's like uh, so there is no, no you know, buying that you are seeing to, uh, at the launch, which we have to carry forward. No? Understood. And in terms of, uh, you know, uh, Lebanon and Absorica, particularly for Lebanon, uh, has the momentum improved back to what we were doing uh, pre-COVID levels, particularly given there was a uh, spike in cases again in December? Uh, so was there some sort of an impact in December and therefore we could see more build-up in level on as we go ahead? The number of elective uh, surgeries has clearly come down. So if I look at it from a, you know, on a three-year basis, we are nowhere near where we were, say, two years ago. You know, so, and that's not because we have lost share. It's mainly because the number of uh, patients who are treated uh, have come down because of new requirements of how many cases you take in a day and can you postpone surgery. 
so it's definitely not normalized. We see a seasonal uptick in this quarter, which is normal, but uh, the numbers for maybe the last year or even the previous year would be higher. Understood. And uh, Zimbabwe, I know you don't want to share granular details, but in terms of you know initial launch, it's fairly early days. Uh, any feedback that you think uh, you know you would like to highlight? Is it in line with expectations? Uh, and and also, it because uh, uptick in SGM. So, uh, was that related to the levy launch? So, the levy launch clearly would have increased our SGM because during the launch you would have a higher expenditure. That's for sure. See, then as I said in my re, uh, readout itself, for competitive reasons, I wouldn't give too many granular details on this call. But the only thing uh, which I will definitely say is that the initial response has uh, not just met, but maybe exceeded expectation. So of the doctors that we covered for the product in the first three months, 80% of them have given at least one prescription for the levy, which is a very good uh, indicator that the interest level at the customers for a new mode of action is very high. And then, of course, it's for us to be able to use that as a base and increase the depth of uh, prescriptions from these doctors and uh, continue to improve on our uh, launch performance. Understood. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Nima. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kunal Damesha from MK Global Financial Services. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so just one question on the, uh, you know, how we account the specialty phase. Uh, do we kind of account uh, the uh, phase as a pre-coupon rate or we kind of net out the coupon or any assistance that we provide to uh, customers in our sales number? So this is, this is account that is called a net off top line. Net off of top line. Okay. Okay. Because I think uh, as far as I remember, uh, when we had Exorica uh, coupon program, I think that at that time we were accounting uh, the gross phase and then I think coupon was netted in marketing expense, if I remember it correctly. Um, no, no, no. I, I do not think so. We have been having a okay. policy of accounting uh, towards the coupon. Okay, sure. And uh, if I look at, uh, for the second question is on, if I look at uh, the x star of EMLs, uh, the gross margins are kind of, you know, sequentially compressed by roughly 100 days. Uh, so would you ascribe this to uh, geographic mix shift or uh, just the higher raw material prices? Or, you know, uh, any any particular mix of both the uh, items? So, so my suggestion would be that we should look at annually instead of quarter. And further, mm -hmm. I have also published the results and uh, given the press release in terms of their results in the contract. Okay, and uh, uh, lastly, if I may squeeze, uh, so we have said, uh, you know, uh, our specialty phase are doing well, but would it be fair to say that in Lumia nine month phase are comfortably above the FI21 level? Yes, they will be. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Prakash Agarwal from Access Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, good evening. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, my question is on R&D. Just trying to understand better. We've been talking about higher R&D and also expected trials to start, uh, you know, further trials for Lumia, etc. Uh, how do we think about it? I mean, if you see the run rate is still about five and a half, under six. In the past, we have talked about 8%. Uh, so how do we expect the year to close and uh, what's the outlook for the next year and what kind of trials we're talking about for next year? No, I think the objective is to spend that kind of money. Uh, I think, like what Abhay said, is that some of the challenges in terms of patient recruitment, uh, especially in the kind of studies that we are doing, uh, which are extremely competitive trials where uh, competition for all potential patients to participate in study from multiple companies is very high. So it's kind of leading to a 
uh, much slower recruitment and that but thereby uh, this we are making multiple efforts uh, including diversifying the geography in which we are doing the studies so that uh, we can spend the intended money what i think we share with you every year is the plan to spend i think uh, your assessment as to we are not been able to spend is a fact but uh, hopefully we should kind of uh go back to the kind of money that we wanted to spend and does that impact sir some delay as the trials are getting delay uh, in terms of uh, the uh, the new trials starting and closing and hence the commercialization it would have impact yes i mean that's where the uh, effort would be to find a way to minimize that impact okay thank you uh, and second one was on the us uh, so I don't comment that you know, uh, kind of bottoming out and uh, with the new launches and uh, supply chain improvement, we expect you know things are bottoming out and to improve from here. Uh, but uh, what we heard from the different other companies also is about that pricing pressure has been continued. In fact, we talked about more uh, you know supply chain challenges like freight costs, etc. So I mean, what is changing for us? Do, are we seeing a spate of new launches? Uh, Uh, and uh, there is some corrective action being done, or what exactly gives us confidence on the base business X tariff for the US? Typically, in a quarter, um, we have been able to launch close to five or six products each quarter. Uh, that's that's one thing which uh, helps us. and of course we have been consistently saying on every single call in the past few years actually that pricing pressure which is product specific we continue to uh, face but then we have to be able to overcome that with launch of new products which we have been able to and uh, that is supply chain management so these are the only uh, two tools which can help us uh, stabilize our business and uh, find a way to grow in a competitive market Okay, so we expecting launch date to improve, or what is exactly changing? The launch date may not uh, improve. I mean, we are very clear on what are the products we have in our in our R&D portfolio. When are we supposed to launch them? And I think the visibility I have as of now, going ahead, is also we should be. I mean, you know, don't look at it as each quarter, but average for each quarter should be in the same range of. Anywhere from five to six products. Okay, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Anubhav Agarwal from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Good evening to all. Uh, one question is uh, on the U.S. specialty business. So this 180 key run rate. Uh, would you say a day that this uh, new base that on which you can grow even in the March quarter? I am asking because. I remember last year in December we had some stocking benefits, and March quarter number was much lower than the December quarter. Would you say that was just one of last year? This is not the case this time. So it's a combination of not just uh, one or two products, but we also need to see how in Q3 the overall uh, Absorica franchise contributes or does not. But oh, but the whole idea is, I mean. When, when we run the business, we don't look at it on a quarter-on-quarter basis necessarily. We look at long term: do we have head, a headroom to grow, and what do we need to do to continuously grow on each of our franchises? And I think the way I look at it, uh, each business has opportunities to grow their own uh, franchise and their own product. So, uh, rather than answer it as a next quarter uh, question, I would look at. Uh, Enough headroom for the businesses to grow their own franchises. But just the clarity on that, like you mentioned, that level and typically has a seasonality which is uh, peaks out in December quarter. But any other product, you a little bit spills it. over to Jan Feb. A little bit spills over to Jan and Feb also. So it's typically in the winter months, which goes up to at least February, where you see a seasonal impact on uh, you know a lot of dumb products, not just level and but even acne. uh there is a seasonal impact so but other than 
the term product uh, the other portfolio normally does not see any spike in the numbers in the december quarter and not as uh, prominent of course not as okay. prominently so sure. second question is on the other expenses so we as uh, monish have been saying that uh, we have seen increase across the sorry, sorry i'm not able to uh, I mean, I have a sort of a mechanical sound when you are speaking, so I'm not very sure I'm catching your question. Yes, this uh, second question is outside the U.S. That on the overall company, uh, this is on other expenses. This question is that, as in the com initial uh, commentary was mentioned, that we have seen increase in other expenses across the business uh, segment. But just trying to understand how the far away of close we are to the normalized level of the company. Like we've been talking about pre-COVID, we are at a certain level. we will not go back to the peak covid level but how close we are to that number are we very close because we seen a let's say surprising increase sequentially which we were not expecting but are we very much close to that uh, normal number sir so all about the thing is that as, as i said in my read out that yes uh, we have been guiding the which are as market operations normalized so which we have witnessed but more important is that Of the product mix and the job mix also helps us to maintain the margin despite the cost pressure increase. However, having said that, we are having a close watch on that so that we can contain and maintain the momentum of the growth on the EBITDA. Sorry, uh, there was some disturbance. Uh, so, so uh, net net, uh, 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 what what is the response? Are we closer to the normal level or are we still far away from that? They go up slightly higher than the current level, but not anything uh, significant. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Samir Baisiwala from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, about this on the U.S. specialty business, uh, when do you expect the Uh, footfalls, um, you know, in the doctor clinic to you know sort of normalize to pre-COVID level, and which products are getting impacted because of that? I guess it's uh, Levulon and Elomia. Anything else? So first of all, I mean, the first question, I mean, I can, uh, I really cannot guess, uh, uh, Sameer, because even today, I mean, I saw the morning news, the average seven-day cases are still like five hundred thousand. Uh, so that's not uh, small. Uh, so footfalls at the doctors' levels, I mean, are restricted, and clearly access to reps also much lower than pre-COVID. When will it stabilize? I mean, your guess is as good as mine, so I don't know. And if I look at it very broadly, then you know, every single product does get impacted. Only the extent of one or the other really changes. Electives are the worst hit, but really speaking, the Impact is on all products. Okay, so I mean it's quite commendable that despite uh, you know lower activity, uh, you know you are able to grow your specialty so well. No. Uh, thank you. I will definitely communicate your uh, comment to my team members. Um, it, it's uh, nice of you to say that. But the way I look at it, and uh, I guess this is a. Uh, uh, to for everybody when you have a level playing field it impacts everybody so that so that way it, it you are not disadvantaged over anyone else so it's a common scenario for everybody i think it's all a question about how you execute in a change environment uh, as a team and as a company which eventually makes a difference okay great and the second question is on when levy i know you won't give any specific details but uh you did not cite winlevy as one of the specialty product that you know drove quarter on quarter growth um so was winlevy not an important contributor because your prescription trends in iq uh, were shows a pretty good traction there uh, if you recall i mean we launched uh, the product only on the 1st of november so we didn't have the full quarter uh, that's one uh, secondly i think uh, Uh, November and December are also many days of holidays, so the real impact of uh, wind levy sales will not be seen in uh, Q3. Some of it may actually be seen in Q4. <clears throat> okay, just final one on wind levy. Uh, uh, that was quite helpful. Is uh, what's the typical you know uh, uh, duration of um, 
you know of treatment um, if the patient is is using using Vinlevy. In the sense, you know, is it a chronic use? There is an argument for a lot of repeat uses, or or no? Too soon for me to really give you, uh, you know, uh, a quick handle on that because uh, see, the one tube is supposed to be used by a patient for a month, but uh, and then even if it is not used, the patient is supposed to discard that and use the next one. Uh, whether that is really happening, whether they are this this product, unlike an Exorica, for example, doesn't have a rinse program. So the patient uh, may or may not visit the doctor every month. So, so what kind of uh, you know prescribing and uh, adherence behavior is being demonstrated? Uh, we are also trying to understand more, and I don't think I have a very accurate answer for you, Sami. But it's a great question. It's something knowledge. that I am also trying to um, get an accurate answer to. Sorry, I'll just take uh, one second more. So, so Abhay, this is helpful, but I guess what I'm trying to say is, uh, fine, you know, real life is, uh, situation is different. We don't know what's going on. But just medically speaking, scientifically speaking, uh, what do you think would be a typical duration? I know it varies from patient to patient, but on an average, is that three-month treatment cycle, six-month treatment cycle? Just any, any range would work, you know? I, I don't I don't know, Sami, so I don't want to, like, give you an answer which I cannot back it up with scientific data. Because even today, I'm not you know 100 percent uh, clear in my own mind whether this has been used in a majority of patients as a first line monotherapy or in combination with existing therapies. So and therefore, you know, if you if you use as a uh, sort of a combination therapy with other products, then what the doctor decides to continue, what uh, the doctor decides to maybe stop or be away from. Um, yeah, are, are the, these are the questions in our ad boards we try and get answers to. Uh, as of now, the information is so sketchy. If I give you a sort of a clear answer on this, I may be misleading you. Samir, I think if it's helpful, then Vinlevy, like most of the acne products, the clinical trial is a 12-week trial. And the primary endpoint is reduction in the severity of acne. Now, along with that, all products also have to do a 12-month safety study in certain subset of patients. So my sense is that depending on the severity of patient and the type of acne that they suffer from, the duration of treatment uh, will be different. So I think the challenge is to understand what is the percentage of severe, moderate, or mild acne patients, and uh, how doctors treat them? So, if it's helpful. Yes, absolutely, Delivery. Very helpful. I got a few more. I'll get back in the queue. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Krish Mehta from Inam Holdings. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for taking my question and congratulations on a great set of numbers. Um, I, have, I had two questions. The first of which is on uh, the psoriatic arthritis trial. Could you provide any update on uh, how you are seeing footfalls for enrollment or how we are progressing on that front? So, when I explained about the uh, relative challenge in terms of recruitment of patients, psoriatic arthritis, one such uh, trial. So we are not uh, on schedule, and we are trying to find a way by which we can uh, catch up by multiple strategy. Okay. And my second question was actually on the R&D front. So as we've seen that the quarterly spends have gone down as a percentage, and you explained that it's due to the lower footfalls. But assuming that the footfalls normalize after a few quarters, how do you see R&D going forward in terms of uh, building a steady state increase in organic R&D versus more of uh, you know acquisitions or partnerships that we saw with Winlevy? So what's the strategy in terms of R&D going forward? I think our sense is that the study state R&D should be around 8-9%. 
because like we have this uh, SCD044 study in phase 2. After the phase 2 is complete, we will then have to enroll subjects for phase 3, and that will be much more expensive than phase 2. So like that, there are potential indications that will uh, keep on increasing the cost going forward. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Damianti Kirai from HSBC Securities and Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my question is on speciality spend. So with pickup in all the key brands, uh, how should we see uh, cost moving ahead? And are you uh, near to cost be given for your speciality portfolio? Uh, maybe you will uh, refer to the cost or should I? No, generally I think, Abhay, we haven't been sharing segment-wise profitability and cost. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the past, I think we have indicated that we are in an investment phase of this business. And I think uh, depending on how the clinical trial costs continue and how we capture the clinical trial costs, it will require uh, significant investments going forward. But uh, I think uh, overall, I'm happy with the margins that uh, we've been able to improve in the whole business. Okay, just to clarify, on the uh, clinical trial part, obviously it depends on uh, progress in the pipeline asset, but uh, has like have you optimized cost more on the marketing and uh, promotional part for the key brands? So with that you need to respond. Yeah, I think for most of the major products, we are clear enough of uh, what is it that is going for us to succeed and uh, stable uh, expenses. But for a new product like Winlevy, of course, there will be disproportionate investment going in. Thank you. Uh, my second question is on your uh, capital allocation strategies. Is like, uh, where are you uh, looking to invest mostly, uh, say for next uh, one or two years? So I think philosophically, as a company, we've always looked at uh, our preference for investing in businesses or creating businesses with ability to grow steadily year after year. And I think uh, that philosophy will continue to drive our future investment. Okay. Uh, can you call out, like, what are your uh, capex plan for FI22 and 23? No, I think this year we haven't given any specific uh, guidance, but uh, in the past I think we've indicated that uh, our major CAPEX plan uh, has been kind of complete till our volumes go up significantly. So till that point of time, I think we will have marginal new CAPEX in all businesses, all facilities. Sure. Uh, thank you. I'll get back in with you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Tushar Manodane from Motila Loswal Financial Services. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. So just on the U.S. generic X tarot, uh, if you could share what kind of price erosion you're experiencing on the base portfolio. Um, we look at it on a product-to-product -product basis. It's never on a on portfolio. And, and each product has a different kind of... Uh, um, scenario. Like, I think in the last call, Mr. Sam, we also mentioned that it's not a basket. There are some products on which we face pricing pressure. On some products, we may be able to take a small price increase as well. So, net net, yeah, we always say that there is pricing pressure, but, yeah, but uh, obviously we wouldn't give a number to say in that we have this percentage of price erosion on the base business. Okay, because if, like, 
with what that net number is and the kind of launches we have and the kind of base at which currently we are like if i normalize the 3q us as generally x star of sales then we are more or less at a 1 billion dollar kind of a number so uh, going forward will the new launches be able to offset the price erosion is what you know i'm trying to understand i mean that will be our attempt And just on uh, on the Illumia per se, like so the conditions of mild severe psoriasis and the psoriatic arthritis are um, quite often related, and the peer having now approval for both the indications. So you see the change in the way the doctors look at like uh, let's say Illumia and the peer products, or you will see still continuing prescription rate uh, on a single indication. In a way, Mr. Shankar has answered this question in response to a question asked on this call earlier. That not having the indication does have an impact, clearly, and that's why we are trying to speed up our trial so that uh, we are not disadvantaged with the peer products. I'm so sorry. I would. I I'm so sorry. No, no problem. Thanks. Uh, thanks. I hope thanks this helps you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Surya Patra from Philip Capital. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you for taking my question. So, uh, is uh, uh, this amphotericin B in CZT exclusivity what you are thinking of? So, how big is this opportunity that you think? Because uh, it's a old product and discontinued by many, but uh, the prescription progression and all that, if you can see, then it looks like a larger product than. Uh, then that is looking like, and uh, is it a kind of a rightly timed product uh, approval that uh, we can see considering the COVID COVID uh, trend that is what we are witnessing in US? Uh, I don't know what information you have that it's a discontinued product because that's not my understanding. Now. it's the only approved generic and because it is a difficult product for which no generic was approved the fda by a separate uh, direction it that the first approved generic will get six month exclusivity once it is approved it is launched within 75 days so uh, we should be able to Launch this shortly. Uh, it's it's an interesting product. It's not a very large product, but the sales as well as the uh, growth of the product are uh, in public domain. So you should be able to see that. And at the same point of time, I think in the U.S. it has never been used for uh, COVID. COVID. So uh, because this mucormycosis. <laughs> problem that we faced in india it is not a problem faced by uh, any patient in other geographies so it's not been used for covid sure sir uh, so secondly on the uh, can you split the r&d spend between the speciality and uh, the normal generic i think it was part of my read out 23% oh, sorry yeah okay I mean that, and just ask one question: so, is, is the price erosion trend for the taro portfolio is meaningfully different than the uh, non-taro portfolio? You commented obviously it is the price erosion cannot be portfolio based, but uh, no. Also, uh, we can't share any information about taro beyond what they have shared. Sure, sir. Fine. Thank you, sir. Wish you all the best. No, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Samir Basiwala from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hi. Thanks for the repeat. Just a couple of things. Uh, is there any update on halol uh, reinspection? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we uh, we haven't heard back. I think last time also I said that right, is that we've requested them for. Uh, inspecting the facility uh, and we are yet to get any indication as to 
where, when they will be inspecting and uh, so hopefully soon is our uh, expectation Sir, is it uh, hurting our business a fair bit uh, in terms of not getting new launch, uh, new approvals, especially some uh, some complex uh, products? I I believe so because uh, uh, it it would be affecting our business and growth. Sir, one final one uh, uh, for other income, four thirty crores. I don't know if you have. Um, given uh, the breakup, or is is there any one-offs uh, in this? We are given the breakup in the uh, in the readout. I just said, uh, Samir. Oh, I missed that. It's a it's a uh, settlement income for Dusa Bio Frontera of twenty-two point five million dollar and interest on income tax refund. Yeah, but uh, you know, uh, how, how much is the income tax refund? So that we have not disclosed, but the Baraya Frontera settlement amount, 22.5 million dollars, is disclosed. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ritesh Rathod from Nippon India AMC. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, can you give some co quantitative color on the uh, India outperformance in terms of the we had done MR addition, we had launched number of products. So how much increased has been on the doctor coverage? Uh, how how effective has been this product launches in last 12 months? Sure. Yeah. I think uh, India business uh, as uh, all three quarters has done well. Uh, it, I think we are doing well in India business is a combination of a lot of things. One is uh, whatever strategies uh, we thought during this financial has worked well. The team has executed all the strategies and the team is also performing uh, above the expectation in most of the territories. We are also focusing on uh, building brands. So that's also working in the right direction. Uh, as, a, as far as the prescription is concerned, we are already leading into 11 doctor categories where we are number one. And the new product launch momentum has also gone up substantially in last two, three quarters, which is also helping us to grow the business. As I said in my readout, uh, we have expanded uh, two years back, and that has also worked well for us. Almost 70% of the territories are meeting our expectation. And uh, what we are seeing is that the remaining 30%, how they will improve their performance in the next one or two years. So India business performance is a combination all of all of these things, uh, which are working well. And we are getting market share after, from quarter one to quarter two to quarter three. So in quarter three, we almost reached market share of 8.6%. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. the highest in the recent times. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, on the second question on the Dharma sales force in US, uh, from when maybe you will leverage the existing sales uh, the sales force uh, MR, MR or would you have would you set up a a trade thing uh, for that? So we have a separate sales force for uh, when maybe and Absorica franchise. So would there be an opportunity for cross leveraging because? The, or, or you, are, you would be deploying Absorica field force and basically there won't be any incrementary cost. So there was an existing uh, Absorica field force and uh, we expanded that to be able to meet the requirement for the Vinay launch. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Anubhav Agarwal from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Sir, thank you. Uh, uh, one question to Molika is on the accounting for the specialty sales. Uh, I, I think you mentioned on the coupons that you report uh, sales net of uh, coupons, but what are the royalty? For example, in Illumina you that you pay to Mark or Vendelli that you pay to the partner. Where is the royalty component shown? Royalty expenses or expense stock paid? Sorry, can you repeat that again? Royalty payments or expense stock payments. Yeah, so that will be captured in other expenses? Correct. Other expenses. Okay. Thank you. And the uh, second question is to Abhay. Uh, on the Illumia, just want to understand 
with uh, for this product uh, roughly uh, medicare and medicaid put together will be uh, what percentage of the product i am not interested in the exact number but will it be less than 50% more than 50% some indication no, sorry what is the question can you voice on, on the medical on, one of illima revenue uh, how how big is medicare and medicaid put together as uh, it is a significant uh, uh, portion but uh, i would not be able to give you an exact percentage but it's uh, meaningful so i was trying to say i mean will it be more than half or less than half so the venue say meaningful um i i really don't want to get into that granular uh, detail because uh, what you're asking me the question of strategy and uh, uh, that information may hurt us okay thank you thank you the next question is from the line of anubhav from mc research please go ahead hello uh, yeah hi a uh, couple of questions on speciality uh, one uh, uh, could you share views on competitive landscape for astorica uh, as such and uh, what could be the market share now is it still around 7% So all our uh, forms of Exorica, the, the original brand LD and the authorized generic put together, we are more or less have, uh, maintaining the market share we had earlier. I mean marginal bit, but more or less. Uh, okay, okay, that's great. And uh, secondly, uh, uh, last quarter you mentioned that uh, for Nirvan uh, there was some supply chain issue. uh for 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 if you can just mention what was the issue it was more from the uh, uh, uh supply or on the side kind of or distribution side and is that issue are the over with that issue so more to do with uh, the quality testing which is outsourced and because of covid they had their own issues but uh, this quarter has been much better and uh, i think the next quarter will be able to improve further okay okay not okay. quite helpful thanks for that thank you the next question is from the line of sayan mukherjee from namora securities please go ahead yes yeah, sir good evening um sir on emerging markets in your initial comments you mentioned uh, some strong growth across markets and we have seen that traction in the recent past Uh, so can you uh, provide some color what is driving is is there a covid related element there uh, and how sustainable the growth uh, in the emerging markets that you're seeing i think a large part of our emerging market business is branded generic business and uh, they are all based on generation of prescription so there is a certain amount of consistency and continuity in that business now i don't have that level of granular understanding of different markets that whether the markets are positively impacted because of the uh, what you call covid or not generally in most of the geographies that i am familiar with covid has a negative impact on overall business and we don't have a large portfolio of covid specific products in emerging market so and also if you see over last uh, few years emerging market has been consistently growing year after year so hopefully we should be able to maintain that continued growth okay so sir i was saying because you know despite covid we are seeing you know good growth in those markets uh, so sir are you uh, in terms of strategy are you looking at uh, own development products or partnerships uh, is it new products or market share gain in existing products uh, broadly speaking i know it may be you know different for different geographies but any broad broad uh, trend that 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 is there driving the growth so actually i think it will be both uh, the increased share of business and new product what i think the business has made up in spite of uh, 
significant erosion in currency of some of the key geographies say like russia south africa brazil which are important geographies which have seen significant erosion in the value of their local currency so if we actually uh, adjust for or, or at a constant currency actually every year emerging market has grown at double digit okay 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 uh, so this is one uh, question on capital allocation uh, you know because your cash generation is quite strong so uh, you know you have been investing in specialty quite a lot uh, as you were building it out uh, at the same time you know you are what kind of opportunities you are seeing uh, let's say in branded business in india or uh, emerging markets or even in us generics i mean given all the pressures that are there uh, in these markets do you think uh, you know uh, you, you you know there is a possibility of opportunities uh, beyond speciality and if there are would it make sense for sun to sort of uh, you know pursue such acquisitions especially you know meaningful ones no i think in the past we have indicated that we are continuing to look at uh, speciality assets either existing products or uh, products close to market uh, or existing businesses where we believe that we can add value and the product business is of strategic uh, long term importance for the company so that philosophy continues to be the same is that we want to find a way to put our capital to use where my it can help us uh, uh, grow profitably year after year challenge for us has been to be able to get businesses which we believe that uh, will help us hopefully i think uh, we should be able to break this uh, what you call drought of potential acquisitions that we've seen in last few years in next maybe one or two years okay so that's helpful and the so last question if i can uh, you know that speciality number is it possible to break up between us and non us or any color in terms of growth that you want to give uh, between us and non us geography so so we are sharing the global specialty revenues for competing uh, regions we would like to stick to our current of us Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That was the last question for today. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Nimish Desai for closing comments. Thank you, everybody, for uh, taking time out to join this call. If any of your questions have remained unanswered, please do send them across. We will have them answered. Thank you, and have a good day. Thank you Ladies and gentlemen on behalf of Sun Pharmaceuticals Industries Limited that concludes this conference call Thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines